Okay, we're in the second video for the patterns to do a face mask and a full length isolation gown for a medical gown. There were a few things that I need to mention that the instructions around the sleeve cuffs gets a little bit um, fuzzy. And that's because when I took my initial pictures of it, the sleeve cuffs had that same material that sweatshirts have that's a sort of a knit cuff and I know I have none of that material so I'm probably going to use some belting elastic that I have until I run out of that and then after that I might do some sort of thing similar to the neckline that's going to be a series of snaps so that it can snap tighter because it's got to go from being a 12 inch uh, hole to gathering up around people's wrists. Now my wrist is about six inches around and I have a fairly tiny wrist. If you were to do snaps, if you had one to tighten it to six inches, one to seven and one to eight inches, an eight inch wrist is pretty big. Three snaps, one inch apart, that should get the widest variety of wrists and then they can always put their stretchy gloves over the cuffs. I just didn't have the same material that they had so I knew in my instructions I was gonna have to do something different with the materials. To start with we need three yards of 45 width fabric and about two and a half if it's 60 wide. Well I have three yards of this fantastic Saved by the bell in living color, 1980s. It really looks like, like an 80s music video. So this is what I'm going to make my first robe out of. I haven't actually tested my pattern yet, but that's gonna happen right now. I'm gonna follow this layout instruction, 45 wide, 32. I'm gonna cut out a rectangle. Then I've got 23 and 23, that's 46. So I'm gonna do a 46 inch strip. And then after 46, then there's a 25 inch strip. So I'm gonna do these strips and then I'm going to slit this one and do the 16 inch at the top to 23 on the bottom, 16 top, 23 at the bottom. I'm going to take this strip and cut it. So I've got 24, both sides narrowing down to a 12. 24 both sides narrowing down to a 12 and then any scraps that I have will either become more of the uh, 8 inch by 8 inch masks or they'll be made into double fold tape this I have a spool of bias tape that I found out of nowhere so that's going to get used up but uh, I'll make strips to do the ties on it but this is actually going to take some uh, surging or pinking when it comes to surging and pinking, you're gonna either wanna have an overlock machine or you're going to uh, need a set of pinking shears. That's step three. Because if you do the pinking shears, which give you a zigzag cut, that prevents fraying a little bit, or you could go over the edges with a zigzag stitch. But if you don't have an overlock machine, you don't have pinking shears and you don't have a zigzag stitch on your sewing machine, go back to making the mask because these robes, uh, the doctors need to change out of these robes after every patient that they see. They go through the laundry. So these things are gonna get laundered to death. And if you don't have your seams so that they don't fray on the inside, eventually they'll just kind of explode in the laundry and just be a bunch of string and chunks of fabric. So that's going to be important to either have an overlock machine, pinking shears, or some sort of zigzag stitch so that you can stabilize the edges on this fabric so it doesn't ravel. I'm wearing my Ready Set Art. I wish I had a Ready Set Sew t-shirt. I had an 80s radio mix playing while I cut out the pattern. And right when I started cutting out the pattern, the song by AHA, Take On Me, came on. And it got stuck in my head. And I whistled along to it. And I do do dooed along to it. And I didn't think very much of it. And I kept having it in my head throughout the video. And when I uploaded it the first time to YouTube, YouTube decided that I maybe broke copyright rules 
because I had the radio playing while I did my sewing. So now you guys just get to listen to me talking, maybe whistling, probably whistling. Let's go over to the weight bench and have a brief talk about thread because we're going to be using a serger overlock machine. The difference between regular spools and cones. Cones are usually made specifically for a serger. These are going to be a lighter weight of thread. They're going to be um, easier to snap by themselves, but usually a serger is going to have three to four threads that are co-supporting each other in the overlock. So if you've got cones, great. If you've got weird colors, like a violet, couple teals and a pink, and you want to use them up, great. But you can use regular thread as well. You just want to stay away from button thread. Button thread is really extremely thick. I think I'm going to use up some of my weirdo colors first just off of small spools because uh, I have an abundance, but there's some colors that I never seem to use, like oranges. That's pretty orange, so I think I'm going to pull some oranges and some pinks out, use as much of those up, and then if I run out of those in my main spool box, then I'll move over to my serger thread. I'm going to start off showing you my simplest uh, serger overlock machine. This one is just a three thread machine. And um, how I like to re-thread them is I just cut the previous thread and tie it off and let it go through the lower loopers. I do the same with the needle thread, let it go through, and then just when it gets about here, that's when I cut it and relace it through the needle. So I'll show you all the inside. Most sergers are gonna have some spiffy diagram for you to follow. And this one's nice, it's color coded. It's got a red, a blue, and a green. There are some sergers that are four threaded. I've got two four threaded sergers, and there's even five and six threaded sergers. Uh, I'm just gonna go with my simplest machine for right now for anybody who's uh, experiencing this for the very first time, or maybe it's not your first time, but you're still not comfortable with the serger. The serger is a little bit exciting because right here, it's got a scissors blade that cuts off anything on the right side of where the needle stitches. So that's important to remember. You don't want to get anything folded up underneath because in a regular sewing machine, if it gets folded up underneath, oh, you just need to pick out a few threads and redo a little bit. This one, if it gets folded up underneath, it gets chopped by that set of blades right there. Also, it's very important to keep your hands away from those slicing blades. It's even more important than on a regular sewing machine. So now that I've terrified you of this machine, I'm gonna show you how to re-thread it. I'm almost out of thread on the lower looper. The lower looper is the one that goes all the way underneath, across to the other side, back through here and then up and out the back. It is the most painful one to have to re-thread and that's why I like the tie-off method for restringing it more than anything else because it means that I have to do less little fiddly work. Now the loopers use more thread than the straight stitch over here on the left side. So you can use any thread you want for this, but if you have some of those um, fluffy threads or, um, gosh, what are they called? Mm, I can't remember. But if you've got bigger threads or, or thicker threads, those can go through the loopers pretty easily because the eyes on the loopers are uh, much bigger 
than a sewing machine needle. So I'm going to tie that off there. I want to save this blue because it's a really good color for denims. So I'm just going to move that and I'm going to replace it with, I think I'll use up uh, this itty bitty bit of red. There we go. So I've got lower looper, upper looper, and the straight stitch and my machine. All right. So something I like to do is I put a trash bucket right below me when I'm working on my serger because as I push this through the machine, all of those scraps are going to fall straight down in between my legs. And unless I want to sweep up the floor, which I probably need to do anyway, because I've got mega dust bunnies. Uh, if, if I don't want to have to sweep up the floor, I just uh, put the trash bin right between my legs. When I start off my serger, I like to take a little scrap, make sure that I've got my tension right. Make sure that the tension and everything is good on your machine before you get onto your actual project. So I'm going to come to the end and I'm going to check my tension. All right. The front side looks pretty good, but the back side. I'm pulling a little bit from the top looper, possibly because my lower thread is a bit thicker. So I'm going to just tighten up the tension on my top looper a little bit. It was, whoa, down at one and a half. So I'm just going to move it to two. How does that look? Oh, look, you can see my pile of stuff in the background. Hooray. Ignore all the junk. Technically, it's not junk. It's mask making things. Okay, it was going good until, oh, I ran out of that tiny bit of red. Okay. Okay, I have to rethread my upper looper because I didn't catch when that little spool of red was running out. And if you can see, what the upper looper does is it kind of does a knitting needle thing with the lower looper. So what I have to do is I've got to clear the threads that are on top of it so that it's not knitted up in them anymore. So again, with my fine crochet hook. There we go. It's now out of the way. Thread the needle, which has a really massively big eye. And I got it. Whew. By the way, every time you're rethreading this machine, because you have your hands all around the needle and everything, it's a really good idea if you have your machine unplugged. Not just turned off, turning off a uh, false sense of security at times. No, it's even better if you can manage to unplug your sewing machine entirely. And in the lower looper snapped. So close. It was so close. All right. Hang on a second. I'll show you how to rethread the lower looper in the middle of a project. All right. So first thing I need to do is get the upper main needles thread out from there. So I'm using a, just a fine crochet hook to unhook it from there. Now that is out of the way, I can address the looper thread. It goes through this lower looper needle. And notice how big the eye hole of that needle is. Same with the upper looper. Those are like massive big holes. So it's pretty easy to thread them. However, on the lower looper, it goes back behind 
and you've got to hook it back forward, hence the crochet hook. Now my mom likes to use a uh, dental floss tool, but uh, I've managed to misplace all of mine uh, a while ago, so that's why I have uh, resorted to the crochet hook. There we go. Now I can thread it through that giant eye. And this is where a pair of tweezers is really handy for you to grab it from the back side. Reach from the back. Come on, go through the hole. It's kind of hard. There we go. There you go. All right. There we are. We got that. Whoo! All right. We're ready to start up again. Use the full 45 inch width. I didn't have to serge the bottom or the shoulder seam on the uh, front or the two back panels. I had to do all four sides on the trapezoidal sleeves though because those were all cut. So that's something nice. You can use the selvage edge and you don't need to finish that. Before I do the shoulder seam is I'm going to take my back panels. I'm just going to fold it over and do a quick little top stitch for this edge. Now, if I didn't have this overlock, if it was just pinked, I would do a double roll on that to protect that edge. But because I do have that overlock stitch, I can just go over once and then top stitch that down. I'm going to make it fairly narrow uh, and that's just going to be up the center back so that when it is right sides out it will just have a single stitch. I'm going to do um, the longest stitch I can do because this isn't really structural. Once I get to the shoulder then I'm going to do maybe a two or a three but I'm going to crank it all the way up to 11, I mean four, and uh, do a really quick stitch on both of my back panels. There we go, both back panels did 
really quick top stitch, just folding it over about a quarter inch. It's just like we did with those tie-on straps for the mask. So if you're going from the beginner mask to the more intermediate robe, it's just what we did on those straps. Now we have to put pretty sides together with the center seams matching up. And uh, then we're going to stitch the shoulder along the top. As a step to save me uh, suffering and frustration later, I'm going to press the shoulder seams nice and flat. Magic! It's already ironed. All right, so the slit goes in the back, and right now I know it seems a little bit choky, but that's because I haven't yet cut the circle here for the actual neck hole. So this is actually going to be further back, and these seams are actually going to be up here on the tops of the shoulders once the actual neck hole is. In fact, it's going to be a little bit further back than uh, it is right now. But, ta-da! Body done. Time to do the arms. Okay, lay the sleeves on. Center fold of the sleeve to the center shoulder seam. Both of them on there. I'm going to pin it down a little bit more and then I'm going to put it under the sewing machine again in the middle of a sort of backwards kimono thing. And while we can still lay it out flat, it's a good time to do our neck hole circle. Now the neck hole should be slightly towards the front, but not all the way towards the front. So we're gonna be cutting a little bit into the back, but mostly out of the front. I'm gonna just kind of eyeball it so that it's about, about two thirds of it is in the front and one third in the back. And I have to use both hands because it's pulling on the fabric. So I'm gonna pause the camera. There we go. I went around with my compass and there's a very faint pencil line that I know is not showing up on the camera here, but I can see it for myself personally. If you don't have a fancy little compass like this, a nine inch paper plate totally works. Um, this, I have it at a four and a half to do my little swivel thing. Um, the average neck size is much smaller than this, but this is that big so that it can uh, snap shut and have some overlap in the back. All right, the sun's setting. I'm about ready to put the double fold tape around the edge, uh, and then I'll do the side seams, and then I'll add on the snaps, and I'll add on ties, and this robe will be, oh, and finish the hem, and then this robe will be done. So it's only like five more things, right? Cole is now done. Now it's time to put the right sides together, and we're going to match up at the armpits. We're going to start at the armpit and go down the body, go back to the armpit and go down the arm. And then we're going to trim the hems and the cuffs so that they're even. This way, uh, in case something is uneven, instead of going all the way around and ending up with it uneven and not matching up at the armpit, it always matches at the armpit, and then we just trim the ends. Fairly large for Let's try that again. All right. So I've done the side seams all along here. This is the sleeve. And I don't have the material that they used uh, originally on the ones that they actually have at the hospital. They've got the same cuff material that you would see on a sweatshirt. Well, I don't have any of that. So instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn back the cuff, I'm going to sew a channel with a little bit of gap, and then I'm going to lace in this elastic on the inside. I'm gonna make it for a small wrist. My wrist is about six inches around, so I'll make it for a small wrist like mine. But even a small wrist like mine, if I were to stitch this down, it still stretches out for a much larger wrist. So 
Uh, this is just a waistband uh, elastic for like skirts and things like that. So it's uh, some pretty burly elastic, but that's what I'm going to use in the cuffs. And after I do that, I'll finish up the hem and then it's making the ties. And then this piece is done. All right, I'm going to show you my trick for elastic in the cuffs. I've already sewn my channel, but I've got this gap in it. On the tail end, I safety pin that to the garment, and then I put one of these big baby safety pins on there, and I shove it in to the cuff. And that way, I've got something hard to push through, and that tugs the elastic through all the way around. All right, I've got the elastic through. I'm gonna do this overlap and I'm gonna switch to the zigzag stitch. And then I'm just gonna smooth out the elastic. I like giving myself a little bit of overlap with the elastic. I just find that, that makes things a little bit easier on me so that if these stitches pull out a little bit in one spot, it won't completely undo it. If I just did one single straight stitch, there's a possibility that a single uh, snapped thread would make the elastic totally fall apart on the inside. But if you do two rows of zigzag back and forth, that's going to hold pretty snug. It is the next morning. I have not had my morning cup of tea. I am here in my stream like no one is watching shirt. And uh, I got distracted last night as I was putting the elastic into the cuffs. So I need to review through all of my video. The exciting thing about that distraction was I was talking to an individual who knows how to use CAD computer aided design. He's uh, He works at a telescope interstellar telescope place in California and I will figure out where that place is and let you know. Uh, I gave him the dimensions for the trapezoid sleeve, the rectangle with partial circle cut out uh, front panel and the uh, one of the two mirror image back panels with the partial of that circle cut out of it. And really that was the part that drafting wise is difficult to explain because even when I did it myself, I ended up having it a little bit off center. It needed to be slightly over, but hey, this was my first try. So figuring out the math for this arc on that is something that uh, I don't know how to do, but thank God for the math nerds because they know how to do that stuff. I was uh, more of a, a theater geek, so um, I know how to do things in the physical world, but translating them over to uh, a digital media is more difficult. Somebody also suggested maybe making pattern pieces on wrapping paper could be wide enough because you need to have something that will do 32 inches wide. There's other people out there and a lot of them are staying at home just like the rest of us and if they can help you know that's awesome okay i'm just gonna go with what i've got recorded and um i'll just try to fill in the blanks in comments as people ask me questions so i used a belting elastic on this and it does have quite a bit of give which means somebody with an eight inch wrist will still feel comfortable this it's uh, actually a little bit loose on me but if somebody has a smaller wrist they can put a plastic glove over the top it is very likely though that we're going to be running out of elastic because when i went to the fabric store to pick up some more fabric for making robes uh they were completely out of elastic except for the sparkly waistbands for little girls tutus elastic which i did buy because it's what they had a lot of people are making masks and robes and things like that and a lot of the stores are out of elastic so another option is to uh do a snap closure and i'm going to try to film this on my wrist, which means I need to switch to a tripod. The idea of having snaps 
the cinch in the wrist is a way to go around not having elastic. So you're gonna take some of your double fold trim. This isn't actually double folded yet, but it does the, the idea for now. You're going to make a tab of it and stitch it into the seam. That's where you're going to put one side of the snap on. I would say probably the button sticky outside. And then one inch in, you put a snap, another inch in, you put a snap, and a third inch in, you put a snap. And that way you will have three different tightnesses that this wrist could be. You could just do two snaps if you don't have a lot of snaps, but that's one way of cinching it in without using elastic. You might need to undo some stitching, fit it in, stitch in the tab, and then put in your snaps. That's a way that if you have no elastic, you can still cinch it in. I'm gonna show how to apply snaps on the next. The example robe at KVH had the ties on the inside under the arm on the right and the outside on both the underarm and the left. That way, the left side ties inside, at the right side goes over the top and ties there, so there's a lot of overlap in the back. That's why this is such a big garment. So that means that the right side is going to go over the top of the left, so we're going to put the uh, snaps in such a way that uh, the left side is going to be the receiving end and the right side is going to be the pushy pokey and button end on those snaps. Many of us sewers have uh, somewhere grandmother's cookie tin that is filled with little notions. A lot of us will have small snaps like these. The larger the snap, the stronger it's going to be. So if you've got this style of snap, these are stitch on snaps. And you use those four holes just like stitching on a button and you just stitch around the outside edge to attach it on. But an even better style is if you have one of this style where there's a thing that you hammer and it's more like putting a rivet or a, a grommet into the fabric. These are for jackets. I have these which are lovely. Look at that vintage. Uh, and it's got the sort of explanations here on the back. Uh, I think these got cut down because grandma knew what she was doing when she was using them. Uh, and so the instruction sheet which was on the back of the original box, wasn't important for grandma. Man, I could have used it. It looks like uh, you use a pencil to push stuff down and then a wooden spool. That doesn't look right. Yeah, a wooden spool to set things in place. And then you hit it with a hammer, I think. Yep, hit spool with hammer until parts are engaged. So yeah. Um, I'm glad that there was an empty spool here too. Now, if you don't have any kind of snaps, you can switch over to hooks. Put the loop side of the hook on the left side and then put the hook side on the right side that goes over the top so it goes in and hooks on. Instead of the hooks trying to catch a loop, you've got one hook trying to catch a series of loops. So. And these also come in different gauges. They're the same thing that's on uh, bra straps, actually. So you know that those are pretty sturdy. They come in a whole bunch of different arrays of sizes, but I would say the larger, heavier duty ones, the better. You don't want to get quite massive on them, though. This one's probably a little bit too massive. This would be something that you would use for a cape or a cloak or something like that. So you can use hooks as well. I would avoid buttons because uh, buttons get a little bit fiddly. I would also avoid buttons on the wrist cuff because if you've ever tried to do French cuffs from your you know, good hand to trying to do it with your left hand on your right wrist, you don't want to have the doctors fiddling with things too long. So snaps, best, hooks, okay. Velcro, I don't know how good Velcro would be. It might catch in, it might catch in the doctor's back of the neck hairs. So uh, Velcro, maybe. 
and buttons as a last resort. Yeah, snaps is the best choice. Da, da, da. Hooks with the hook here, loop, 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 so they can catch different loops. Then Velcro, I would say fuzzy, a long band, and then hook side, actually, no, hook side here, facing out, and then fuzzy side here, so that if they've got a big neck, they got the fuzzy side towards them. And buttons, as a last resort, you can put a button, uh, three buttons, and then one buttonhole, and then they can try to hook their robe on the buttonholes. But I would do buttons last resort if you just do not have uh, snaps, hooks, or Velcro. Instead of Alice's adventures in Wonderland, it's my adventures in vintage sewing notions. In trying to push the, uh, the prongs through this neckline, this is five layers of fabric. It's a fold outside, a fold inside, and then the material. So I was unable to push these soft brass tongs through that. However, if I had a heavier, larger snap, or if I was hand sewing these snaps on, I could have done that. Now I wanna have these about an inch in for the first one, push it through the material. Then I very carefully select the correct side for those prongs to slide into, lay that there. There's concrete underneath this faux wood floor, so I'm not worried about damaging my floor, but you might wanna go out to the garage for this. There we go. A little bit more. That's pretty firmly in. I'm gonna go out from the other side. That snap is in. And now we're gonna do the same thing for the stud side, but we would need to do it on the inside of the garment for the stud. About an inch in, press it through the fabric, lay the stud down and this is i think why they had a spool because with a spool you're not gonna smash that button on the stud cool a few more hits now this one i can't really do the reverse unless i fit the stud in there Yep, that works, okay. Testing the snap. The snap snaps. There we go. Now I just need to repeat that uh, MC Hammer time uh, two more times here so that this can uh, have some more overlap. And I might do an additional snap um, and I'm gonna be spacing these about one inch apart. So now we need to do the ties. Now we're going to need four 24 inch long strips. This is just a double fold tape that I've done a zigzag stitch down. Uh, double fold tape you can find in the video on mask making. And uh, this is just a little bit wider than what I used uh, on the mask. You can also use, this is about I want to say half inch to three quarter inch uh, ribbon. I'd use grow grain ribbon, but you really have to uh, finish the edges on that. Otherwise it'll catch a thread and then prrr, fall all apart and just completely unravel. So you could tie a knot in it or you can fold it back and stitch it. These, uh, yes, there's a chance for it to unravel as well. So where I cut it, uh, First, there's going to be some attached to the garment, so that's going to hold that end. And then on the loose ends, I'm just going to go back and forth on the end just to stitch it down and make sure that it's not going to unravel. So four 24 inch long ties. I have all four of my ties cut now, 24 inches long each. That's two feet long. The first one that I'm going to put in is on the inside right. It's going to be six inches down from the armpit. And I'm stitching it on the inside so that the left side can come in and tie to it, and then the right side is going to go over the top in the back. So six inches down from the armpit, inside right, six inches down from the armpit, outside left, and then the last two ties is gonna be 20 inches from the neckline down the back. There we go. Now it's time to try it on. 
left outside, left outside. It's time to accessorize. Ta-da! Well, there it is, and miraculously, it basically looks like the pictures that I drew. So, not bad for a first try. Now, if you are trying to follow the directions, I would recommend that you just cut out the three pieces you need, the top and back and the sleeve. Cut that out of like a, a plain white muslin first uh, and then stitch it together partly so that you can get that circle. Then take that apart and use that as your pattern piece. You can iron on an interfacing to that so it's nice and stiff. You could also draft it onto wrapping paper, but you might have a little bit of a difficulty with that whole circle cutout thing. Eventually, I'm going to have a CAD file. Uh, it's going to be some sort of visual file that a large format printer can use. If you have access to a large format printer and you don't have uh, sewing abilities, but you can help me out by making physical patterns, the three pattern pieces. You can bone those up together, email me, uh, contact me, mail those to me, and then I will mail them out to all the people that are looking for the pattern pieces to make this gown. It's really the gown that I'm hoping to get pieces printed out. So if you can help me out with that, I would give you an awesome big thumbs up. Thank you. Stay crafty. It's time for the credits. Again, thank you to KVH, Kittitas Valley Healthcare, for reaching out. We're trying to help you as best as we can. Also want to do a shout out to Purple Door Fabric. Shout out to Yvonne's Sewing. Both are very helpful right now. So if you want to donate fabric or if you uh, need to get into contact with somebody, those are two really good local businesses. Fish Food Bank is also looking for masks. They need some to provide for the most needy in our community. A big thanks to my fiance, who is the founder of Mega Moshe. It's a nonprofit organization that helps people with their tech problems. So where he literally held my hand as I cried after I destroyed the front page of my website, they will figuratively hold your hand as you turn your business from a in-person brick and mortar business into an online presence with online meeting coordination, online sales, things like that. Go ahead and check them out. Thank you to Morgan Katha, who works or worked at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. I think he might have even been in something called Karma, which is kind of nice right around now. So thank you, Morgan, for helping me with that computer-aided design. Really appreciate it. Thank you to The Daily Record for spreading the news. Thank you to everybody who's in the email list and busy sewing their hearts out, and everybody who's reached out to donate fabric. We really appreciate you. And also, thank you to AHA for making that wonderful song that's stuck in my head forever.